first thing I think we'd like to do today, a little bit of a filler here, um, but the people of the Kansas field, um, a Kansas University, especially associated with their field camp, put together a short video, um, and we thought that that might be kind of just fun to show before we get started with the teaching more generally. So Doug, do you want to take that away? Sure. So uh, last summer, uh, we had the KU Media Department come out, Media and Marketing Group came out. Uh, for a variety of reasons, but they wanted to talk about field camp and take some pictures of students. This is part of a larger video. Uh, can everybody see what looks like Darcy O'Brien on the screen? We can see that. We have your whole screen, Doug. Okay, great. I will go to full screen, which is what I was trying to do. Um, and uh, this is just a video that they put together. Uh, this is part is about Strabo, but the rest of it's was about uh, the field camp in general. Things we're looking for are the different rock types so we can put it on a geological map. Uh, we're using an app called Strabo that's been jointly developed by KU and a few other schools. It's very user-friendly. It really does break everything down. The GPS will locate you within about five meters of yourself. From there, you can draw in the contacts. Instead of telling you to bring here a pen and paper and mylar and different colors and all that kind of things, you can literally do all that in an app. They can add images, they can add data. Everything is basically in that device. So that's pretty nifty. All right. That's it. it we actually should send out the link. There was a sufficient lag that it, it, it worked more or less. Um, okay, I'll send out the link. I'll just stick it in the uh, chat. But anyway. Um, so the idea today is we're going to um, go through a couple demonstrations of teaching with Strabo, and it will be myself, uh, and then Casey Duncan is the presenters, and then we will go from there about just answering questions. We, we, the idea is that we won't go more than about a, well, 40 minutes, half hour, something like that, and then we'll just have people ask questions about their projects or other things we could do. All right, I am going to then share my screen. Let's see that now. All right, so this, when the pandemic hit in early April, we tried to figure out if we could repurpose Strabo Spot, which was a research tool as a teaching tool. Um, Alec Lusk and I worked on a project at Baraboo because it was um, driving distance basically from Madison. And it was some, it's a place that we take a lot of students a lot of the times in the upper Midwest to work. The short version is there are advantages and disadvantages of using Strabo Spot. What was really nice about using the Strava Spot for these uh, virtual teaching was it's georeferenced, um, the ability to annotate photos. So not just the person doing it, but the um, students could annotate the photos. Um, using image base maps and going back and forth, I'll show some of that. And then the idea of spatially relating field trip stops, I suspect everybody else kind of gets the students out of the van, they wake up, they have no idea where they are. And this was a way of kind of keeping track of where they were relative to other places. I'll talk about this later, but there was a big effort on to develop digital virtual tools. A lot of people defaulted to Google Earth because of the 3D um, visual advantages and Strabo Spot does not have that ability. Um, of course, with Google Earth, you're not sharing your data really. Um, so again, trade-offs like usual. So what we did is we developed a module where the students were going to gain practice in um, using Strabo Spot, but using the pull-down menus um, as a foundation for interpretations, identifying some of the basic rock types because you could take pictures of them. Um, you could recognize different, um, different primary versus overprinting fabrics, and then you could relate the field 
um, measurements in the field to large scale fabrics. So it was developed as sort of an undergraduate structure class exercise. The module um, is estimated to take about four hours to complete. Um, because of our experience with this is we developed a whole new teaching um, tab under Strava Spot that was not there in March. It is there now um, where you can put what you have. You can basically put an exercise and how it's specifically for Strabo. You can make a link to that. And the important thing is that anybody, we, anybody can now add these teaching activities. So as a community, we can decide to develop a list of activities. And Kevin Mahan um, is the first person who's done this sort of outside our immediate group. He's done a very nice um, exercise in online mapping um, and basically more detailed analysis of that. So for him, this is a capstone experience. Um, and this is on the CERC website. And I'll come back to this CERC website, but there's, again, this is a whole lot of online activities that were developed this spring so that people could share with other folks um, so that they, people could pick and choose what worked for them for online activities. So we did it in Baraboo. It's easy to find using the search interface that I talked about yesterday. Um, here are the spots. If you do, do a zoom to extent to spots, you see something like this, and this is Devil's Lake. Now, one of the big advantages of Strabo Spot is within Strabo Spot, you can use macro strats geology. And macro strat is a program that's mostly stratigraphic columns, but they have a very nice map interface where you get different images at different scales of resolution. And this is a base map. So the students can know where they are basically by plugging in this base map. Um, to them. So here are the spots on the state map of Wisconsin, but as you zoom in, you get more detailed. Here are the spots now on a, um, uh, I guess it's a, a more, um, I think it's a one by two degree sheet. I just don't remember right now. Where you can see that there's a, a syncline here, there's the axis of the syncline, and you can see that the spots one through four lie on the south side. Um, five, six, seven on the north side of Baraboo, and you can look at the difference in structures. So this is all from the desktop application, but it works on the field application as well. So we're going to look first at the southern limb structures. So these dip all shallowly to the north. What we decided to do with the teaching activities is we used the notes tab. So it's the second tab you see after spots to put a whole lot of description about how to base it for the students, how to use the program, and then notes about what we're asking them to do. So you can give them a handout as well, but also you can inherently put the information into the Strabo Spot um, worksheet. So that's how we did it. Um, so for instance, this is the first outcrop you go to. It's for sale, apparently. Um, and what you can see is that there's three points. And the question here is, is there bedding here? And if there's bedding here, what's its orientation? And in, is it stratigraphically up or is, or is it structurally overturned? So those are basically the teaching questions at this spot. So one way you can do, and we said um, what I, what we did here is we said, assume the road is horizontal, or I would put up um, painter's tape on the outcrop and say, the blue tape is horizontal. Tell me what the strike, and you're looking, here you're looking in direction 090, and tell me what the strike and dip of the bedding is using right hand rule. So um, this is the type of thing we could do. For any point, um, like a spot, you can go in and then I suggested that the students have images tabs over so they could see details of those rocks. And so the question here is, which way, what is bedding? What's the evidence for bedding? And is it overturned or not? So you've got ripples here on the left. You've got lithologic change here as you go from quartzites to fillites. 
and then you've got these cross beds that tell you up is this way. You might see the faint up arrow. You can ask students to annotate the photos. You can annotate them yourselves like we did, or you can ask have them use the sketch tool to annotate the photos. What's nice about this is the students can interact while they're there. And in some ways, this Strabo module would work equally well if the students were there in the field on their own and still you're asking them to label actual photos um, that you know contain the features you want. So it works virtually or it could work in person. Um, this area uh, is, an, is the next stop. It's also quite interesting um, because this is the first place where you have to start dealing with um, cleavages. And so you have the cleavage in these phyllitic layers and then you have different cleavage in the other layers and then you pick up some, uh, some vein arrays um, in the phyllite layers only. So you can sort of ask the students, say, okay, here's horizontal, what's the orientation of the cleavage? What's the orientation of the vein? Do they have, are they kinematically compatible? Um, a very nice thing about Baraboo is it has these minor structures in there. We're gonna come back to this. So you can talk about, is there a symmetry here? And what's nice is with this picture, I'm, I have a whole bunch of measurements that I've taken here and then the camera's gonna turn 90 degrees to this face and you start seeing boudinage next, like where the Sharpie is. And so students have to sort of grapple with the 3D nature of the outcrop. If you could import a drone image, you could do that to show sort of more of a 3D image. Um, we didn't do that level of sophistication. All right, you can go to the north side. Here, this is a place called Van Heys Rock where the bedding is vertical. So you have a quartzite, phyllite, quartzite sandwich here, all up on end. And then the questions become, what's the orientation in the phyllite? What's the orientation in the quartzite? And what is the connection between the uh, foliation in those two rocks as you go right to the edge? And so again, it's, you can use this as direct student attention in ways you want to do. At the end, we just ask them to make a simple cross section through here. Um, and we say, you know, you can go back to this picture of the small scale fold. And what you realize is that small scale fold, if it was truncated, is basically the cross section through Baraboo. And that you can use the small scale structures to mimic the larger scale structures. Um, and in both, in all of these cases, you're looking in direction 260. Uh, and so the students would presumably turn in something like this. What's nice about this is the students have this background image and they could use the sketch tools to draw directly into the data system as well, what they were going what they found. Um, so in conclusion, sort of what we found out from doing this is the students can keep track of the location pretty well. We got them to take care of strike and dip, which seems trivial, but they have a problem with it. Um, the ability to annotate a photo is really helpful for them in the field. Um, and again, there's ability to just have a blank piece of paper. If you want them to sketch, it's a little clunky right now, but um, won't be in the future. And the, the drop-down menus that have that controlled vocabulary, I think are quite useful because they can say what kind of foliation is it. So that's, um, that teaching resources. I just wanted to point out that there are other field-based teaching resources. So there was a big effort. Um, NAGT was great in sort of spearheading this and a group of us pushed for this. Um, and ultimately a lot of people defaulted to Google Earth, but some people use Strabo as a basis for those field experiences. But if you don't know about them, there's um, digital tools um, available on these different webinars um, that are explained and might be useful for fall teaching. All right, that is all I have to say about that. I'm happy to um, take questions or um, also Alex, do you have any, I should ask Alex since he did half of this, do you have anything you'd like to say? Nope, I think you covered everything pretty well. 
I'm going to check the chat window, see if there's anything else coming up. It looks like Alex is answering those questions, so. Um, how far, how well did the students do in figuring out strike and dip? It, that was, um, I don't really have the ability to evaluate that. Um, we did not implement this uh, because I was not teaching. The reason I could do a, a lot of the organization was that I was on sabbatical. So um, we did not um, implement this. We were basically just trying to figure out how to develop a teaching module and then we just got informal feedback only from um, a couple people, but that's all. Casey, are you on the line here at this point? Yep, I am here. Great. Um, I'm going to answer the other questions um, online, and then Casey, why don't you just go ahead and show? Casey also developed a circ module. Um, based on Strabo spot for sedimentology, um, and I'm, I thought he did a nice job, so I wanted to have him show you this beautiful and much better exposed area of the world. All right, well, thanks, Basil, and, and hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to be presenting this, this module that we developed kind of centered around this exposure of the Jurassic Carmel formation within the San Rafael swell of, of central Utah. Uh, now, I, in my rush to cover a lot of material yesterday, I failed to acknowledge uh, the, the main sedimentologists that have been working on this project, uh, Marjorie Chan at the University of Utah, Liz Hajek at Penn State, and Diane Kamola at the University of Kansas. So I wanted to make sure and, and uh, acknowledge them that they're, uh, and their contribution. So, you know, along with those, the geologic information system aspects that the basil has already talked about, the, the particular way that we've structured Strabo set, or the sedimentology options within Strabo, uh, and, and the, the vocabulary-based workflow, or, or vocabulary-based uh, structure of the, the data inputs, makes this very useful for teaching. Uh, we tried to structure uh, we tried to structure the, the, the vocabulary and how we use Strabo based on the sedimentologist workflow. So since, since it is structured that way, this becomes very useful then to help guide students through sedimentary data collection. And, and really even, even as, you know, uh, you do in, in research applications, this becomes very useful because it, it helps prompt uh, you know, oh, okay, so I've, I've added sed, uh, sed lithology attributes, what, what next? Oh, okay, uh, sed bedding, and then you can kind of march through the different, um, uh, different tabs that way. So this, this really helps kind of prompt the students through the workflow and also reinforces sort of the terminology, workflow, what data they should be thinking about and, and how they should be thinking about that data. So it becomes very, very useful for teaching. This uh, particular module that we've developed is based on two projects, and we'll we'll take a peek at, at both. Uh, one, the short section that we that I demonstrated yesterday in measuring through the uh, Cedar Mountain formation uh, on the on the western east, eastern flank of the San Rafael swell. Uh, but the the principal data set that this project is based on is from the, uh, that exposure of the Jurassic Carmel Formation. Now, while, while we haven't put together a, uh, like a, a formal lesson plan uh, with set activities and methods for assessment and, and, and the like, what, what we have done is we, we've tried to put together a, a flexible framework to cover three main topics. The first, is using Strabo, Strabo as, as a field notebook, you know, determining your map location, adding data, establishing stations, collecting observations, and, and you know, take, taking advantage of Strabo's ability to track and co-locate different data types. The second uh, main component of this 
is a quick exercise to sort of reinforce differentiating and describing lithophases. Now you could use either, either project for this. Uh, and then the third main portion, uh, probably the, the, the largest portion of, of this, uh, this module is uh, exploring different aspects of stratigraphic sections. So this is also flexible in that you could use it as a qualitative exploration of strat sections, just focusing on stratigraphic concepts, or you can use the data that we have in the, in the project to construct a measured section uh, through the Carmel. So uh, Basil mentioned the uh, Strabo Spot teaching uh, tab that is now added to the, the website where you can find the, the Baraboo uh, materials. Uh, we also have the this the said version listed here, uh, but there's another place that you can go, and that's linked uh, at the at the bottom here to go to the the CERC page that houses all of these. And uh, if if you or a colleague ends up using these materials, I'm, I'm certainly looking for feedback. So I'd be I'd be happy to to hear any that you can provide. So with that, let's uh, let's actually go to the CERC page, or well, well, we'll start at the Strabo Spot teaching. And we've got uh, the, the module kind of walkthrough listed here in both PDF and uh, DOC format. Uh, and then we've got links to the uh, Strabo Spot search that will take you to the, the data sets themselves. But first let's, let's start off and go to the CERC page where you can read the uh, you know, overall description, the goals, the learning outcomes we wanted to meet. Uh, but then the meat of the, the modules is listed here in the description of teaching materials. Uh, and what I'd, what I'd like to start out just stepping through the, the overall outline for this. Uh, now we envision this as being uh, sort of a one day activity. Again, it's very flexible, so you can use it all a carte to teach however you'd like, uh, especially if you want to expand to include formal uh, report writing. And this is a, a, a drone image from uh, where, where we measured the section. So, so we, we're actually working on the, uh, along this dirt road here. Uh, there's a suburban here for scale. And we'll, we'll see this photo again when we go into the actual data set. Uh, but it's the, the principal, you know, bulk of the material is, is centered around this, this beautiful exposure of these rocks. We have some background on the, the Jurassic geology of, of the area. Uh, and, and also include uh, a snapshot of the, uh, a drone or a 3D outcrop model produced from, from drone imagery, which feature in the, the data set. Uh, what I'd like to, so this, this outline includes the links to the, uh, the Strabo Spot search page where you can access the data. Uh, but I'd like to just show kind of these, like, like I said, we, we wanted to provide a, a flexible framework uh, to give really a buffet option for teaching sedimentology, however you might uh, want to use it. First activity is using uh, Strabo Spot as a, as a field notebook. Students could take their, their favorite hand sample or uh, something from their collection or, or even just things around their, their neighborhood. Uh, and, and, you know, add sedimentological descriptions or take pictures and, and start getting a, a handle on co-locating uh, all these different data types in a geographic framework. And then we start moving into putting those uh, or uh, sort of determining sedimentological attributes, documenting them, making these, these important observations, putting them first into a lithophases uh, uh, framework, and then starting to explore stratigraphic sections. So that's kind of how we've, we've structured the overall module. To facilitate those goals, uh, we have a, a series of data products useful for uh, those, those different activities. So the first uh, is a, an actual Strabo spot uh, output. Uh, I, I just exported this straight from, from Strabo without any modification uh, to show for, for the Justinson's Flats data set to show the, the different spots and data that's available. Uh, 
Now we'll, we'll see how this could be used to construct a measured section in, in just a moment. Uh, but what I, how I've tried to do this is in, in each of these spots, uh, which are, are uh, located in context of uh, snapshots from the, the 3D outcrop model from the drone imagery, uh, provide hand sample and outcrop images and sufficient descriptions in order to uh, describe the different intervals and construct a stratigraphic column. So I've got that for, for all 40-ish meters of this, this section. So pairing those observations with this next piece of data that's available, these uh, outcrop model posters, I've, I've divided up the, the snapshots from the 3D outcrop model into different portions and just annotated the, you know, the beginning of the section, the, the bedding contacts between the different intervals. Uh, so here you can get sort of that larger sort of, you know, bed scale observations and outcrop scale observations, as well as including uh, thicknesses here. Uh, additionally, uh, if you're if if you're using this module to keep it more contextual and, and talking about the uh, you know ins and outs of, of strat sections, uh, we've also provided the the measured section that we collected in the field from Justinson's flats. You can see a snapshot of that uh, on the right here, but it's also provided as uh, a PDF export, and that's that's the. <laughs> the export from from Strabo uh, that I've taken the SVG format and just saved it as a PDF. Uh, each of the uh, images that are associated with this uh, project uh, can also be found here in this PowerPoint file. So you can download all of those and, and using the desktop, you can easily uh, start associating that with, with sedimentological data. All right, well, uh, so now that we've walked through sort of the outline and the, the reasoning behind the different portions, let's take a quick uh, tour of the data set. So we'll go back to the Strabo Spot uh, website and the teaching tab, and we're going to go to this Justinson's Flats data set. And so if I zoom out here just to give you context for where we're working, we're here in central Utah on the western flank of the San Rafael Swell. Uh, yesterday I demonstrated uh, those Green River channels here on the, the eastern flank. We're in here. And the way I've got this, this project uh, organized is I have two data sets. The first is uh, the measured section itself. And the way that I've chosen to geo-reference uh, the, the measured section pathway is by adding that section to uh, this line uh, line spot on the map. Um, I am actually going to switch over to my account here real quick because uh, there's there's something else that I would like to to show. So if we go here in this Justinson's Flats. Go to our uh, well. Let's activate the measured section first. We'll explore explore that. Go to the main map. And one of the cool things, uh, and I can, I can make this available. I, I have a drone map that accompanies all of this. So I'm going to switch to that here. So if you'd like access to that drone map, let me know and I can share the, the map code for this. Uh, but this is a, a way that you could incorporate the, the drone imagery in this and, and having students have you know, real high resolution uh, imagery to back up this measured section pathway. You can see a suburban for scale. Uh, and this, this is a really beautiful image, you know, centimeters per pixel. Um, but within the, the section itself, so we click on this, this line spot. Or first, uh, if I back up here, we can go into this I-70 road cut and we could gain uh, some really nice contextual information very easily. Here I have a, a panorama of that, that road cut that goes next to I-70. 
beautiful exposure. And then I also have that, that drone image showing where we measured the section in relation to that other, other outcrop. So that first goal of allowing flexibility to explore sort of qualitatively aspects of measured sections, uh, here we could you know, start talking with students about uh, how measured uh, uh, individual measured section and a, and a composite section at that how well or not well it represents, uh, you know, sort of lateral changes through the system or, or how well it captures that heterogeneity. So we can, you can grant the larger context and get students thinking about the, the measured sections. Then you can go in and explore the section itself. So if we go into the strat section tab and view that section. So for each of these intervals, uh, you can go in, say we want to check out that very uppermost portion of the Jurassic Navajo sandstone, uh, see what, what images we have associated with it. It's beautiful, large-scale Eolian crossbeds. Uh, students can, can start uh, exploring this data and, and potentially building their own section. Now, the way I've tried to, to organize this is if you want to do the qualitative exploration measured sections and you'd use this measured section data set, or if you want the students to uh, maybe go the, go the inverse and start measuring a section, leading them up to a discussion about uh, you know, measured section attributes, you can start with this annotated outcrop model. So if we go to the main map, the components of this data set uh, are those four parts of the, the drone uh, there's a 3D outcrop model. Uh, these are all annotated posters themselves. So if we go into that, load the image, this is what, what that poster looks like with uh, you know, thicknesses and sort of outcrop scale observations possible. But I've also made this a, an image base map. So if we go here into our image base maps, each of these chunks forms a, a base map that this, to organize data that the students can use to construct their own section. So let's go into there. And now if I go into the, the, uh, into the image base map, we now have individual spots. And these are, these are the spots that are represented in the field, uh, field book, that PDF export, where you can explore uh, in this framework, you can uh, explore outcrop to uh, almost grain scale observations, you know, with the hand sample images. Uh, and I've also tried to include descriptions sufficient to be able to create a measured section based off of this. Uh, I th think that's all I wanted to cover. So uh, with that, I'll stop sharing and, and be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Casey. I think Casey's um, thing is very well done and it shows sort of the power of, of being able to organize in different ways to get students to do what they want to do. In other words, this either get them to analyze a strat section or to make a strat section. And I, I'm sure there are structural geology equivalents of that. Any questions about Casey for um, anything like drone, how much the drone images help to do or how much did it take? How much time? Well, Casey, how much time did that take all in all? Because you had done it for research anyway. Uh, well, the, the flying is the, the quickest portion of all of that. I think, I think that particular flight was only 10 minutes or so. Uh, the processing gets to be depending on what level of detail you want to include. Um, uh, I think, I, I was also using an older version of Agisoft at the time that I made that model. So it was probably a couple days to, to run all the, the imagery. Uh, and then just importing those, those snapshots into Strabo or that, that was minimal uh, time. Thank you. Doug, there's a question, um, which is, and Daniel asked this, is teaching students to enter the data in field books versus teach going, skipping the field books going straight to Strabo. And I know you're 
you're doing in in your Kansas field camp, you've thought about that a little bit. Do you want to say what you do with field camp? Yeah, so right now, um, the first part of the field camp is taught. We have three different people who teach it. The first two weeks is taught by somebody who teaches them to use a uh, field book and uh, paper maps, mylar, you know, very traditional. Then the third week, uh, we do third and fourth weeks with Strabo, and I'm out there for that. And then the fifth and sixth week, uh, we go back, usually the person teaching that goes back to pen and paper. That's what happens at our camp. Last year, I taught the last four weeks and the last four weeks were in Strabo. And if I taught weeks one and two, it would be in Strabo. And I personally think that um, teaching students to use pencil paper and topo maps is probably a thing of the past having them use a brunt and compass, they're probably never gonna do that again. On and on and on. If, if somebody goes out to the field and does their work, if their employer doesn't give them a GPS unit, they'll come back and get one. So I, I, I feel like we might as well embrace the technology and move forward. That's my personal opinion, uh, but still at KU we're teaching kind of standard methods to start with. Thank you, Doug. Um, when we've talked about it for our work, we've also said that we would sort of do paper maps for the first little while and then switch over to electronic. I mean, Almost everybody who's doing professional mapping these days is doing it electronically in one form or another. Yeah, let me just add, I, I haven't mapped on pencil and paper since 1999. And I don't have any intention on going back personally. So. I don't know why I would teach students not to do what I, I think they should be doing and I do. So Doug, as my, Doug, Paul Kelso is asking a question, does every student have an individual iPad? Yes, they do. So the way we, we've been doing this is every student uh, has an iPad, it's cell ready, so it has GPS. Uh, we get projects ready before they go for the first project. A lot of times, by the time they're doing their last project, they're setting things up on their own. Um, and we have a standalone server at the camp. Um, and so we just kind of do everything self-contained like that. The students, what we started last year and will continue doing is the students uh, write their report, plot all their figures, and do everything on the on the iPad. Uh, they use something like Pages uh, to produce their reports, and then they just simply uh, submit a PDF of their report. Okay, there's a question. I have a hand raised from Galaxy Grand Prime. That person wants to ask a question. I'm not sure who that is. But go ahead and unmute yourself if you'd like to ask answer ask the question. Okay, in the meantime, if, um, Michael Wells just asked a question. See if I can read this out. Can you comment on the changes of efficiency of covering ground in the field with a field class? So it, do you spend more time in individual outcrops with Strabo as opposed to a field notebook? It's absolutely the same. Um, you know, when, when people first started out or when other faculty first started out teaching with this, they were worried that the students were gonna spend all their time playing with the program, doing this, that, or the other thing. Uh, when we were teaching this in ArcGIS, I'd say that that was true for the first day and then kind of went back to normal after that. Since I've been using a mobile app, I'd say it's probably true for the first half an hour in the field and then they're pretty much comfortable with what they're doing and, and it really is just how they're collecting the data. It's no longer really... Um, it doesn't really change what you do in the field at all. It just changes how you write it down. 
Uh, and I would say that the ability for students to put in photographs is just completely changed the way they look at what they're doing and the way they collect data as well. I will also say in my experience with it, the students take to it very naturally. The instructors take a little bit longer because they're used to doing things in another way. But um, the students are basically right there and they're kind of, they're all over it and going. Um, the problem is the same problem you might expect that some students are um, sort of slapdash and you need to kind of slow them down, but that's honestly no different from when they were doing it on paper anyway. Uh, Lisa asked, does it improve the accuracy of their observations? Doug, do you want to talk to that? You hearing me still okay? Yes. By, by far. Um, I, I could pull up a whole lot of images at this point on, on mapping and comparison of maps with uh, no GPS, GPS types of images and that sort of thing that we've done at field camp. And um, you have a lot easier time uh, with students getting located at least more or less correctly. Um, and the very first time we, we, long ago when we first started doing mobile computing and, and that in the field, uh, we got funding from the university basically because um, we made the point that we've been teaching students how to locate for a century and, and we still don't teach them very well because most of them don't learn to do it very well. And our motivation for going with GPS is, well, we can't do it. Maybe the students can teach themselves uh, how to locate. If they actually had their location and could see it on a topo map, uh, maybe that's the kick that they would need or the extra help they would need to learn how to do it. And uh, of course, once we started doing it, nobody learned to locate, but they don't locate any more poorly uh, than they did before. It's just that they, they locate well because they know where they are. That's been my experience. The other thing I'll add is, uh, well actually maybe Nick Roberts, I'll ask him because he's done a lot with Strabo 2. And I think with Strabo 2, um, because you take multiple measurements quickly, um, my guess is you're not, you're gonna speed people up, but then you'll also get them to evaluate the observations and the quality of the observations by sort of a statistical comparison, just like a quick, oh, this, these, this one looks different um, than all the other ones. Nick, do you have thoughts about that? Um, yeah, so can we can hear you. Nick, we can't hear you anymore, but we could hear you before. Hey, okay. The internet's a little unstable today. All right. Um, so, since Nick is having some technical issues. I'll just say that I, I think the ability to take multiple measurements and then evaluate them is going to be sort of the way of, is going to take over from sort of being really detailed and exact. And it's just a different way of going. And it just seems like the modern way. So um, Basil, can I share a, uh, a cartoon? Sure. So this is a early cartoon that we had uh, making fun of basil, but this is uh, this is kind of one end member for most senior faculty is that they feel like they're getting closer to the abyss the minute they do this, and then students, uh, of course, have no feeling like that whatsoever. And now you know how Strabo Spot works as well. And and can I just add something? I think you can hear me now. I yeah. changed my internet. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the the real advantage, and I'll show this tomorrow in my Strabo 2 demo, is that you can take many, many measurements and categorize them all at once in a station. So it's going to kind of, the workflow encourages students to 
collect enough data to start doing statistics. And we're developing some of those statistical tools over the next couple of years too, um, to build into Strabo. Thank you, Nick. Um, John Lewis asked, can you advise about sketches to complement their photo? So I'm gonna take that one. So what it turns out sketches become even more critical to do that. And it's one of the reasons I actually still carry the paper notebook with me because I'm doing my sketches in the notebook. I can just do it better still. Um, and then I just take a picture and import the sketch. Um, the, the, the sketches slows the students down as well. Um, we're hoping that because we're using the iOS platform that we will be able to use some of the iOS sketch specific tools, in which case it might be equally good. Um, but for right now, it's still, that's the one thing that I'm still doing um, on paper. Um, and so, yes, that's, it, sketches turns out to be critical, I think, but the, from a cognitive point of view about doing that. But I, I'm kind of, have a very strong opinion about that one. So anybody else can ask. I can um, go ahead, Doug. throw something in on that, Basil. Sure. Go ahead, Doug. I find that student sketches are no more illegible uh, with uh, <laughs> the iPad than they were without the iPad. That might be true. Uh, Doug, Sorry, do you want to comment yeah. about Yvette's comment? Our, does her students go into industry? Do you have a sense for how useful it is for them to go into industry? Do you want to talk about some of the mapping people who contacted, the mining people who contacted us? We had mining, yeah, we had a, a couple of mining people a couple of years ago who contacted us right after we released it. And the showstopper for them was, uh, they really liked it. They liked the database structure. They liked what was going on. The showstopper for them was not being able to incorporate drone images uh, because a lot of them were mapping at one to 10 or one to 100. Um, and they needed that level of detail. Hopefully that's not a problem anymore, but uh, I think they move past that with other uh, commercial platforms. Uh, we have had students who had done quarry mines uh, uh, who were uh, worked for like Martin Marietta where they were mapping in Strabo spot in quarries, uh, but I haven't heard too much about that in the last couple of years either. So, so what, what about like uh, petroleum or engineering? There's also confidentiality issues probably, although you can keep your data confidential. Yeah, I don't think they're ever going to touch this because of those issues. I, I think where it comes in is not necessarily for Strabo Spot itself, but the fact that students um, get exposure to databases and mapping technology. At least in our curriculum, this, is inclu this includes a, a dose of GIS as well. And those are the skills that um, we really want to move on. I think in industry, they're probably going to end up with whatever package the company uses, as well as ArcGIS. So we try to we try to give some ArcGIS plus the other experience, just because almost anywhere they go, that's what they're going to see. But it could change, right, in the future. I suppose if <laughs> something happens to Esri, yeah. If nothing happens to Esri, I don't know quite how that changes not in industry anyway okay thank you yep um i'm gonna open it up for anybody to ask any questions about their projects or problems they're having or um anything else um associated with projects oh randy was going to make a quick uh announcement about projects i believe do you still want to do that randy yeah, sure. Um, we've been getting a lot of people contacting us about uh, projects and things seem to be going very well. Um, I will just ask if you're planning on having a project um, sort of done by uh, sometime this evening and are interested in having that kind of demoed for the group um, tomorrow, then I would, I would just ask that you make a quick sort of three PowerPoint slide presentation and send it to me and be prepared to potentially say a few words about it at the, at the meeting tomorrow. Um, 
with the number of people who have indicated they would like to do a project for this, we won't be able to demonstrate everybody's, um, but we'll, we'll try to get as many of them in as we can. Thanks, Randy. Um, there was a question we didn't answer about whether the tool impacts the drawing skills of the students. I don't know the answer to that question. I do know the annotating of the photos is generally helpful. Uh, that, that the idea of saying, this is what I have, do I really understand what a cross bed is? It's, it's very easy to evaluate um, whether somebody gets that or not. Um, and so that kind of tool I think can be used um, um, preferably um, to, to make some helpful changes in how um, we move forward in sort of teaching this sort of um, geologic reasoning, geologic thinking to people. I will say the other thing that's going to be a game changer is as soon as we get the micrographs, because then you can be in the field and say, well, I wonder what a thin section looks like here, and then you'll have the ability to pull it up. I think particularly for people who are working more in the mid to lower crustal realm, that becomes critical. Um, and I think that will be a major improvement in, how, in our ability to teach in the field when that happens. And that, that is coming. I would say for the people doing um, for the projects, I'm just looking a little bit at the chat. You can also make a link on the desktop if that's easy. If you're doing it on the desktop anyway, just click that lowest most icon that looks like links in a chain and that will give you a link and you can just send that link to um, Randy as well. Randy, do you wanna add anything else about how you want people to send stuff to you? Um, nope, as long as I can find it, it's fine. I mean, a link is the most convenient thing. I mean, a few people have said, like, I put this project up, like, it's somewhere kind of between Boulder and Fort Collins, Colorado, like, you can find it there. And that hasn't been a problem so far, but a, a link is obviously more ideal. Any other problems people are having with their projects that we can maybe, that maybe more than one person's having, so we can move those along? Okay, I think then we can go ahead and stop.